I don't think any piece of media has affected me the way that The Last of Us Part 2 did. I know it's a strange time to write about it. Most of us by now have had time to solidify our opinions about this polarizing title and heal any wounds it had opened. But no matter our verdicts, The Last of Us 2 is one of the best examples that a video game can be more than, quote, just a video game. If you are one of the players that happened to get through The Last of Us 2 unscathed and intact, enjoying the violence and story as they were, I might not have anything new to share with you beyond some positive media psychology research. But I know it took me a few weeks to really puzzle out what I went through psychologically with this game. That might seem extreme, but as a player, I know that my first impressions are usually just knee-jerk reactions, and that for a story as twisted and painful as the one in this game, it takes time and some metacognitive and meta-emotional processing to get the most out of it. In the time since I wrestled my personal feelings about this game, I've also researched dozens of scholarly articles on media psychology and interactive narrative fiction to better understand, from a slightly more objective standpoint, what happened in our minds and emotions while playing this game. And I wanted to show you what I found. This review, like all of my screen therapy reviews, will look at this game using positive media psychology techniques to explain why it disturbed us and to learn more about our relationships with the characters, the plot, and the psychological and emotional impact it had on us. A bit unorthodox, but I need to address the intended thesis of the game first before setting up my analysis for you. Typically, this would come at the end of an essay, but nothing about The Last of Us 2 is typical. The intended message of Ellie and Abby's journeys is deceptively simple, and although it took a dozen hours to get to it, it could be summarized in just a few sentences. Violent vengeance is inherently selfish, cyclical, and cannot heal our trauma. Trauma is best healed by processing our grief through the support of loved ones and by prioritizing compassion and peace in our actions towards others and ourselves. Okay, for many, this message might sound a bit touchy-feely for a game that includes so much bloodshed, but by the end of the story, it is clear that Ellie and Abby had been trapped in escalating cycles of vengeance, which had resulted in the deaths or psychological trauma of almost everyone around them. For both of them, their vengeance had only brought them and their loved ones more loss, pain, and moral degradation. Their obsessions with vengeance as a means to deal with their trauma drastically changed who they were and contorted their ability to connect meaningfully with others until they both had almost isolated themselves completely. Even Easter eggs such as the references to The Count of Monte Cristo, a classic novel warning readers about an all-consuming obsession with vengeance, also points us squarely to this thesis. But, although this message was interwoven in a story in many ways, it was easily overshadowed by the distracting and conflicting play experience of the game. Think about the entire story from start to finish, and we see that what the developers tried to offer us was a shocking, subversive, but ultimately transcendent and empathic experience that was meant to be uncomfortable for players, but was supposed to elevate our perspective from simply rooting for either Ellie or Abby, to instead wish for the path where neither died, neither fulfilling their vengeance, but wishing that both of them would just stop and find peace with the people they cared about. We were meant to feel what these two people felt as they were suffering from immense trauma, rage, and confusion about how to find closure. And we were supposed to realize, alongside and as these two, that neither of them were completely right or wrong. That was the intention of the developers, and that's what some players got, or at least that's what I've heard. But for the rest of us, what we received was more complicated. For some players, they got exactly what the developers were trying to deliver. They emerged from the game and watched the credits satisfied and moved. After all of my research and my opinion, it would be miraculous for any player to have so expertly navigated and performed the emotional and psychological gymnastics necessary to immediately understand and internalize the creator's intentions so perfectly without at least some psychological distress. As I experienced the game, trying my best to organize what I was thinking and feeling during the most intense scenes, like when Ellie and Abby fought each other, I was still caught up by immense confusion, frustration, and panic. 
For many players, we got a painful and punishing experience. Further still, some players felt so punished by the game's narrative that it turned into the infamous online rage we saw unfold in the months after release. So this essay is really for those of us that experienced that confusion and frustration that this game inspired. And it's also for those who had to step away from the game completely or could only bring themselves to watch someone else play it. So I'm usually very careful not to approach game analyses from this perspective. I try to steer clear from creating content that focuses on negativity since there's already so much of that floating on the web and it's not usually helpful. It's not helpful to you to tell you what mistakes developers made when making one game. This channel is not about reviewing game design. My goal has always been to provide you with practical and applicable knowledge about media psychology. But I'm breaking my rule this once because in the case of The Last of Us 2, while it does some important things right, what made the play experience so punishing was the result of a few things they did wrong. A quick disclaimer. When I say that the writers did something wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong because I just didn't like it. The things I argue they did wrong are wrong because they violated some of the most rudimentary and fundamental models of interactive storytelling. And when you break those rules, it almost always results in emotionally clumsy or even disturbing gameplay. Gameplay that hinders the overall intended message. And while it's not wrong to push your audience and make them uncomfortable, and many times that could even be a good thing, if you're not careful, you can push your audience too hard, and that discomfort can actually get in the way of the message you're trying to give them. The Last of Us 2 had some great ideas, but delivered them in polarizing ways which lacked the finesse and empathy needed to communicate them to a more inclusive population of gamers. How content is framed and delivered to us is sometimes more important than the content itself. It's simple persuasion tactics. A lot about successful storytelling really comes down to how well writers can convince us to stay engaged with their story, especially if their story is emotionally challenging and has plot twists. When writers fail to persuade their audience that the emotional energy they're giving to a difficult story will provide a meaningful or satisfying overall experience, audiences will disconnect. The best example to start with is, of course, the elephant in the room. The hardest part of this game on the player's psyche happens about a third into the story, when we shift from playing as Ellie to unexpectedly playing as Abby. After living through the first third of the game as Ellie, connecting with her character and seeing Joel's death through her eyes, and leading up to this heart-pounding confrontation with our antagonist, this happens, without warning. Although maybe we hoped we would only play her flashback sequence, but after the flashback stopped, we were still stuck as Abby. We had trusted the developers to place us back in Ellie's shoes and find out what happens next in the old theater, but day one as Abby kept going. I think most, if not all of us, got to this point and looked around and asked, what? How long is this going to go on? I don't remember seeing anything in the marketing for the game about playing as Abby for as long as we do. In fact, one of the most searched terms for The Last of Us 2 was, how long do you play as Abby? It's evident that many of us were confused, shocked, and worried about how long we'd have to be her. Many players reported that without knowing how long it would go, it was simply too uncomfortable or repellent to play as her, and they put down the controller and never came back. The writers might have wanted to give us a shocking twist with this. But what they didn't know was that they were breaking one of the most uncomfortable rules to break when writing interactive stories. In psychology, there's a term called schema. Schema are kinds of shortcuts and predictions our brains make after recognizing patterns and archetypes in certain situations and stories many times over the years. We all have very complex libraries of schema in our heads that allow us to quickly and fairly accurately predict how stories will progress. What schema mean to us here is that at the very beginning of every game we play, we all immediately do our best to cross-reference every story we've ever watched, read, or played to try to find predictive patterns so we know what to expect and how to prepare ourselves emotionally. After all, our brains are learning pattern-finding machines that don't like surprises as much as we think they might. 
And while the plot twist of seeing that a villain is actually just another complex and traumatized person instead of a symbol of pure evil isn't the most shocking or original twist, what the writers might have overlooked was the fact that we had no idea what we were walking into when we woke up as Abby on day one. By breaking our schematic expectations of the story with this twist, they inflicted quite a bit of cognitive discomfort. We had thought we were playing a straightforward justice narrative, a story of Ellie bringing Joel's murderer to justice. But with this change, we were suddenly being brought into a much more complex and emotionally demanding narrative full of moral traps and psychological discomfort. Where the writers really went wrong was the fact that they had two opposing goals with this perspective shift. They were trying to persuade us to empathize with Abby, which was crucial for the overall thesis of the game, while also trying to shock us with a twist. This secondary goal was largely unnecessary and did more harm than good, distracting or even pitting us against their first goal. They denied us the resolution we'd been expecting, and instead put a new and enormous emotional toll on our shoulders to start empathizing with Abby, asking an audience that you've exhausted and denied closure to open their mind further to not only sympathizing for but identifying with a morally repellent antagonist like Abby, also inspired a lot of cognitive and affective strain that I'll discuss in more detail later as well. But to conclude this point, the twist of the perspective shift made the audience immediately aware of the presence of the writers and their intentions to make us uncomfortable, and that loss of immersion and schematic certainty ended up pitting players against the creators, and when players don't trust the writers, they'll detach from the thesis of a game entirely. To fix this flaw, the writers needed to pay closer attention to the psychology of persuasion, Studies have shown that in order for people to be persuaded into new or challenging ideas or perspectives by media, it's better if the audience feels safe and preferably they need to be in a little bit of a good mood. The Last of Us 2 is not a feel-good story and I'm not saying it needed to be full of good times, but what they did do was purposely make us feel pretty awful. While yes, this makes sense, the story demands a hard look into negative emotions, but when we're feeling negative emotions, that's when we close up our skills of open-mindedness. Our knee-jerk reaction is to turn away from new ideas and to cling harder to old perspectives, such as Ellie's perspective, for a sense of security. And it makes sense if you think about it. Everyone has hated a class or a lesson because the teacher was mean or disrespectful to us. With this unexpected twist and the cognitive distress it gave us, we were given a terrible first impression of the difficult but ultimately, for many, rewarding journey that we were on. And because of the discomfort of this first impression, many players recoiled. What could have curbed this reaction would have been more visual cues within the game or marketing communications about the fact that players would eventually play as Abby for long sequences. Yes, this would have sacrificed the twist, but the small benefit of shocking players ended up doing more harm than good. But in the end, this has always been about the characters and our relationships with them. We want good things to happen to good people, and bad things to happen to bad people, in life, and in stories. This goes back to the very first stories ever recorded by humans. This feeling is called affective disposition. According to affective disposition theory, much like how we identify narrative schemas, when we start any new story, we immediately and subconsciously try to figure out who the good guys and bad guys are going to be. We try to find the person who is supposed to act as our stand-in in the story so we can emotionally attach ourselves to them, and also figure out who the antagonists are so that we can immediately begin emotionally distancing ourselves from them. After we've singled out who our good guys and bad guys are, we settle into firm expectations of wanting only good things to happen to good people and bad things to happen to bad people. Whether a story stays in line with these expectations about who is good and bad deeply affects the emotional state of the audience. We can all remember some movies or books where the bad guy wins or the good guys suffer a tragedy at the end. It affects us emotionally more than we might say. It's hard to digest and can even haunt us for a while when our disposition expectations are subverted like this. For The Last of Us 2, I don't have to tell you that the disposition expectations we developed at the very beginning of this game are turned backwards and inside out by the time we get to the conclusion. Ellie was a character we had already felt close with as a morally good protagonist from the first game. Our brains identified Ellie as someone who was supposed to be our moral exemplar, the person in the story who was supposed to exemplify the actions of a morally good person, and, by extension, ourselves. 
but she became someone very different than we remembered or expected. And Abby, she was supposed to be our evil to the core villain. In a typical story, she was supposed to be killed or would die in some poetic way that she quote, deserved. Our schemas and disposition expectations might have predicted that after what she did to Joel, if we had to sympathize with her, the best ending she would get would be a redemptive death that she still deserved. But that didn't quite happen either. Now, it's not a bad thing to rewrite the formula. Some of the best media we come across plays with the idea of a moral exemplar that becomes morally ambiguous or a sympathetic villain. But when loved, moral exemplars like Ellie become so morally degraded that our villains consistently portray more compassion, kindness, and selflessness throughout their story, this drastic repositioning of roles can lead to even more psychological distress. We end up feeling betrayed by the characters and by the writers. Studies show that we empathize with our moral exemplars. We open our minds and hearts to their worries, concerns, goals, trauma, and motivations. We identify with them and give them our emotional attention and affection. So when Ellie starts killing more people who seem less and less villainous and hurts others for her obsession with vengeance, she ends up becoming someone we didn't expect her to become, and she took us with her. Meanwhile, Abby's story follows traditional redemption narrative cues as she begins to reconnect or form new connections and recover from her trauma through kindness. This isn't the story we expected or honestly wanted for her either. And we can feel gross relating to her or finding her story more emotionally appealing than Ellie's towards the last quarter of the game. Studies show that when you subvert our effective disposition this radically, when our exemplars and villains even trade places, much of your audience will withdraw. But this is the really interesting part that we'll recognize. When audiences withdraw because a story's intended message subverts their moral expectations so radically, they'll do one of two things. Overcorrection. The audience will overcorrect their moral expectations and allow their original exemplar, Ellie in this case, to commit any atrocities necessary so that they can spare themselves the psychological turmoil of disconnecting from her or rewriting her story in their heads. This means they double down and cling harder to their original expectations in hopes that it'll pay off by the end. We saw this for many players. Their violated expectations felt so awful that they chose to stay with their original predictions that Ellie was a morally superior agent of justice, and they stayed determined to hate Abby as the villain, to hate her, her friends, her story, and ignore any sign of positive development for her and even cling to the desire they develop from Ellie to kill her. This is the response when dethroning Ellie as our heroine or moral exemplar proves to be too psychologically distressing to allow, despite the writer's intentions. The second reaction to the violation of our moral expectations of characters is that we simply give up. The audience detaches from the story almost completely, fracturing their relationship with the characters and the message. These players might have disconnected from Abby so entirely that they felt numb playing as her, or maybe they didn't even notice Ellie's descent and moral degradation. This was common for Last of Us 2, especially because we need to play through so many disturbing expectation violations to get to the end. Many of these players stopped playing and stopped engaging with the story altogether, disregarding the game's canon entirely. For those who don't withdraw from the expectation violation, they stayed and pushed through the distress, remaining open to what they were experiencing and were able to connect to the writer's thesis. But given the rarity in which this occurred, I can't help but come to the conclusion that the writers miscalculated how to deliver their thesis. Much like the solution for schema violations, the answer to this problem might have been more visual cues and narrative exposition to players earlier on in the story to expect Ellie to go through a descent, and that Abby might go through her own upward journey as well. Setting expectations like this might seem to make the story less daring, but as we saw, these concepts alone were challenging enough to play through. A little bit of direction might have been helpful. If we knew what we were getting into, far fewer players would have doubled down or given up. While I respect the writer's decision to flip the script and overturn our moral expectations, 
how they did it inspired a lot of negative and stressful emotional states in players that proved to be another wall in the way between the player and the message the writers were trying to impart. One of the hardest hits players were dealt was the realization that what they had done in Ellie's shoes in Seattle was going to have deep moral and emotional consequences in Abby's side of the story. And further, we were going to be provoked into experiencing guilt for doing the things that the game wanted us to do or didn't give a choice in doing. When we were Ellie and focused on her goals and motivations, adopting them as our own, we were motivated and encouraged to partake in bloodshed and revenge. The controls felt so good, and the dynamics for killing people were so responsive and easy that we were persuaded by the gameplay to behave ruthlessly. We tucked our morality in our back pocket, and like Ellie, we might have had to convince ourselves that this was all worth it because of what happened to Joel. It almost felt like ludonarrative dissonance when the gameplay and story don't match up. We were encouraged by the gameplay to kill, but we were confronted later on with a story that condemned killing. Though, for just a moment, I'd like to argue that the writers did put in some good clues that no matter how satisfying it was, we weren't supposed to like killing too much. Unlike in Last of Us, the AIs in this game had a new depth. They had names, and they actually reacted emotionally to seeing their friends killed. When they found a body that we'd left behind, they'd yell in rage. They'd want revenge too. And in the quiet moments, we could also hear them gossip and joke like real people. Worst of all, when you would go in for the close-up kill, the animations always focused on your victim's contorted face as you killed them. Of course, these animations could have been interpreted as just very dark glory kills, but they were always a little too disturbing for that, to me at least. I know some players love them, but to talk about reactions to realistic horror and violence in games is an entire thesis video in itself. I just wanted to give credit to the developers here that in these small ways, they might have tried to clue us in that maybe Ellie wasn't on the right path. But no matter how we felt killing AIs, the cutscene kills were the worst. The characters Ellie killed in cutscenes go from being people she needed to kill in self-defense, to torture killing, to more unprovoked and rage-filled killing. And these were the deaths that were beyond our control. As Abby, seeing Ellie's carnage feels different. If we manage to take root in Abby's perspective and practice empathy with her, despite the writer's best efforts to get in their own way, when we see Alice, Mel, and Owen's bodies in the aquarium, we might get caught in yet another distracting emotional trap laid out by the writers for us. Extreme guilt. This was the last draw for many players, when they saw that their actions as Ellie were going to be shown back to them in such a villainous and shameful light, when Ellie and our time with Ellie was condemned, that was when many shut off the game for the last time, and there's a reason for this. Studies show that when a narrative tries to inspire significant or extreme guilt in an audience for actions that they've done or were complicit in, a natural response is anger. If a narrative inspires feelings of just moderate guilt or simple sadness instead of extreme guilt, people are more likely to be able to tolerate the negative emotions without feeling angry. They'll try to cooperate with the message and turn inward for self-reflection. But people who are made to feel extreme guilt, more than just moderate guilt or sadness, instead felt anger. They reported that the extreme guilt made them hyper-aware of the authors of the narrative, and instead of letting themselves be guilted, they concluded that the authors were trying to manipulate them. As a result, these people became angry at the authors' attempts of emotional manipulation and completely broke ties with the narrative. We saw this as well. When we as Abby got to know Manny, Mel, Owen, and even Alice, the guilt of what Ellie did when we considered ourselves and Ellie a conjoined entity became too much. But this is yet another angle in the trend of the writers pushing too hard and instead of inspiring contemplation or reflection through moderate guilt or a somber tone, they pushed too far and inspired detachment, disconnection, and anger. When we read books or watch movies, we act as observers of the people in those stories. These are considered passive media because these stories will unfold with little to no help from us. Video games are different. They're active media. In a game, we have to play as our characters, care about their motivations, invest our energy in furthering their stories, and we inevitably identify with them. 
In media psychology, identification is the imaginative process in which an audience member merges with and takes on the perspective of a character. While we can identify with movie or book characters too, when we play as a character, we undergo a stronger sense of identification. Playing a character instead of just watching or reading them requires a lot more psychological engagement and entanglement. If Ellie was a book or a movie character, she would always be Ellie. She would be an entity of her own who could act on her own and do terrible things or undergo major transformations while we remain only spectators that could more easily accept those changes. However, because she's a video game character, when we play as her, she becomes the part of the I and me when we conceptualize her. When we talk about our progress in the game, we don't usually say, Ellie got to Seattle. We say, I got to Seattle, or I met up with Jesse. There is an entanglement between ourselves and the characters we're playing that happens naturally and organically because our role in the game is to act as her consciousness that drives her from point A to point B and accomplish her goals, however gruesome they become. Ellie would never move through her story if we're not there to move her, fight for her, protect her, and work with her to accomplish her goals. Same for Joel, and same for any other protagonist you've ever played. So you can see, when we engage in identification, we develop a deep emotional investment with that character. This was always the complicating factor for the writer's intended thesis, the depth of emotional connection players felt for some characters and the repulsion they felt for others. And there is a special term for our cumulative investment in a character, and it's at the root of all of my arguments in this essay. But, unfortunately, it is one of the most loathed and misunderstood ideas in media psychology today. Parasocial relationships. Okay, so, chances are, if you've heard of parasocial relationships within the past few years, you probably immediately associate the term with a negative connotation. Unfortunately, pop psychology writers have taken this media psych term and have written extensively only about its dangers, including, yes, the manipulation of advertising campaigns, the problem of online stalking, or the unequal power dynamics between creators and audiences. And while those conversations are valid, unhealthy or obsessive parasocial relationships are not the only kind that exist. In fact, they make up only a very, very, very small portion of parasocial relationships. The vast majority of these relationships are moderate, healthy, and even in some ways beneficial for us. So for everyone, for those I've just confused because you've never heard of parasocial relationships, and for those who have only heard the bad and are still skeptical, I'd like to offer the accurate and neutral definition here. Parasocial relationships are the emotional connections we feel with mediated others with whom we never directly speak with or meet. That's the long and the short of it. If at any moment you found yourself in emotional distress over the fate of Ellie or Joel, that's a sign you developed a parasocial relationship with those characters. That's all it takes. I would wager that everyone has parasocial relationships, and multiple at that. All they really are are our favorite characters or entertainers. And these relationships aren't as creepy as they sound. I do have to agree that they could have been given a better name, but these emotional relationships are not inherently sexual or obsessive in nature. Every time I write an essay which includes parasocial relationships, I feel the need to include all of these disclaimers because of the terms rampant and outraged misuse, and someday I want to make a whole video fully debunking the stigma around them. Okay, with that out of the way, I want to discuss the way parasocial relationships sit in our brain and how they affected The Last of Us 2. If I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. Our parasocial relationships with Joel and Ellie can run deep if we've played the first game. We might have an evolved mind and a frontal cortex that logically understands people and characters on screen aren't actually in front of us, or that they're not even real. But the older parts of our brain aren't so discriminating. Our parasocial relationships live in our brains in ways that are very, very similar to real relationships with real people. By default, we treat these characters with the tenderness and compassion we would treat a real friend, 
And just like how real friendships emerge, the more we see of someone, even mediated people, the more we learn about their interests, hopes, dreams, pains, and vulnerabilities, the more deeply we care for them. There's also a compounding effect between parasocial relationships and identification. The stronger your relationship with the character you play is, the more affection you feel for them, the more deeply you identify with them and absorb their emotional lives, their goals, and their decisions, even adopting them as your own. The more experiences we have with characters or in case games as the character, the deeper our feelings grow. So it would take nerves of steel not to develop a parasocial relationship with Joel and Ellie after spending 20 plus hours in the first game getting to know them and seeing them endure so much pain or enjoy some good times developing a father-daughter bond. For a real example of how these relationships grow and how they feel in our minds, if you played Last of Us, take a moment and reach back into your memories and recall how you felt about Joel at this moment, when you saw him for the very first time, before you knew who he would become. He was probably just any other game character you saw, but how did you feel about him by the time you got to this moment? Or here? Or here? Knowing what we do now about identification and parasocial relationships, we can understand, even though Joel never existed, why we felt the way we did when finally we arrived here. Studies have found that when a character we have a deep parasocial relationship with dies, we can experience genuine feelings of grief, sorrow, loss, or any other emotions tied with bereavement like anger or depression. Although our minds know he isn't real, our brains truly feel the pain and loss for having lost him. For all the grief we give games about being just games, the pain these images and memories give us are evidence that something important and meaningful is happening in our minds and hearts when we interact with serious narratives like this. Our feelings for Ellie grew as well, from when we first met her, when we were neutral to her, to her triumph over David while protecting herself and Joel, and even later as she grew and developed relationships with others. Additionally, we suffered as ourselves, as Ellie, and for Ellie after Joel's death. As you can see, in games that split perspectives, we adopt many roles and half-roles and live through each narrative event from multiple minds and hearts. An interesting knack of parasocial relationships is that when a character we have affection for commits some wrongdoing, we naturally forgive them more easily. Instead of condemning them, we end up expanding our moral definitions and are more willing to accept bending some moral codes for them, much like how we would for a real-life close friend or family member. Because our relationship with them feels more important in our brains, the brains of social creatures, than abstract moral codes, we easily give our wrongdoing loved ones the benefit of a doubt that they just had to do what they did. We saw this in Last of Us. When Joel killed all the fireflies, even though it was shocking and probably didn't feel right as we were playing it, within weeks of the release, players ended up more willing to eventually decide that Joel was in the right to kill everyone. If these same players had only seen the ending without playing that first 20 hours, if Joel and Ellie were nameless characters we didn't know, I'm sure we would have still condemned or at least further questioned the murder of dozens of people, murders which included the death of the only person who could develop a cure for an apocalypse reeking infection. Some of us might have even agreed that the death of one girl might be worth saving the world, but because of our affection for Joel and for Ellie, it felt psychologically better to decide that he had to do what he did. I'll say that although I disagreed with Joel's actions, my parasocial relationship for his character allowed me to kind of sweep the gravity of what he did under a rug. Though, I almost feel like The Last of Us 2 was the writer's challenge to this phenomenon. Did they see our reaction from the first game, our loyalty to Joel, and just want to push us harder? Part 2 seemed to confront us, asking us, how much are you willing to forgive, accept, or ignore for the sake of your connection with the character? But I think just as how they underestimated the depth of commitment players had for Joel and their acceptance of his actions at the end of the first game, they underestimated the intensity of the relationship players had with Ellie 
And while I would usually argue that parasocial relationships are positive connections, I will say that it can become unhealthy when we prioritize these one-way relationships over respect for others. We can all try to stay aware that the ancient parts of our brains and their affection for a character might need the guidance of our logical frontal cortex to mitigate the stress of a challenging story before lashing out at others. Moderate parasocial relationships and healthy feelings they inspire can serve elevated purposes. Through Ellie and Joel and our mindful affection for them, we can learn a lot about ourselves, who we are as people, and our emotional landscapes. We can learn through these characters lessons about trauma, connection, love, and redemption. But there's another side to this coin. For Abby, the typical parasocial relationship players experienced for her varies greatly. But a relationship does grow, no matter what we do feel strongly about her. For many, it was an entirely negative relationship, one characterized by deep dislike and disgust. For others, that might be how it started, but by the time we got here, here, and here, we might have felt something different. But all of us started with a negative relationship with her because of one defining act. Like I explained before, seeing Joel murdered inspired genuine emotions of loss, grief, anger, and despair in our brains. As a result of this, we instantaneously built a deeply negative relationship with Abby. But here's the psychological trick the writers might not have accounted for. How negatively you felt about Abby was relative to how positively you felt for Joel. The more you had cared about him, the more you probably came to hate Abby. And this is why you can find compilations of all the different ways you can kill Abby with hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. The writers seem to have forgotten that Joel was an extremely well-loved character. So well-loved that he was literally pardoned by most of the fanbase for killing dozens of innocent people. Whoever was going to kill Joel was going to receive the same amount of inverted hatred. If our love for him blinded us, the hatred of his killer was going to blind us just as much. The writers didn't seem to grasp just how efficiently this hatred, this negative parasocial relationship, would hinder players' ability to empathize with her, and how it would ultimately hinder the message of the entire game. Of course, they must have wanted us to hate her so that we'd go through a lot more to learn how to empathize with her. And some good lessons require a lot of work. But I argue that they pushed players too far and miscalculated the intensity of their fans' relationships. When we have a negative relationship with someone, real or fictional, our brains react the same way. It tells us to create as much distance from them as possible. That cognitive discomfort we felt when we woke up as Abby was our brain immediately rejecting the sudden proximity we felt to Abby. If your brain was already upset at the idea of being around her, of course it was going to be deeply disturbed when it realized it would have to be her. This is what inspired the intense disgust or repulsion from players. Something else that's interesting is that many had to recreate distance from Abby by leaving the game entirely forever. Another cognitive trick is that some players who were determined to keep playing had to subconsciously create distance from Abby by becoming bored, numb, or detached from her or the thesis of the game. They would purposely kill her or put her in harm's way in order to maintain that emotional and psychological distance and so that she would never become part of the I or me when we identify with the character. It takes a lot of grit and determination to get through all of these cognitive discomforts and the several walls that the writers put between us and their message. And for many of us, it was almost impossible. If the writers had known that our negative parasocial relationship with Abby was going to be so strong, would they have pulled their punches? Probably not. But I think it's a shame that they locked so many people out of being able to appreciate the game's thesis. From here on, I'd like to leave the negativity that has eaten up much of this essay and share the most important things that Naughty Dog got right with this game. I'll come out and just say it. The Last of Us Part 2 would have been an incredible novel. What they got right was that the writers made an amazing book or movie. Many players reported having to stop playing the game for themselves because of the discomfort, but ended up enjoying the story as they watched somebody else on YouTube play it for them, 
effectively transforming this piece of active media to passive media like a book or a movie. But much of the writing worked better as passive media, at least it worked better for our brain's expectations. On paper, The Last of Us 2 is profoundly interesting, a story where you get to read both sides of an all-consuming conflict as two mortal enemies exact vengeance on one another, killing almost all the people each cares about until they eventually decide to find peace. It also sounds like an Oscar-winning film idea. As a book, I'm sure it could have been the kind of story that English classes would interpret and analyze for years to come. But what was particularly well designed were the ways that Ellie and Abby's stories reflected one another's. Each of them misunderstood the revenge as justice. After Ellie kills Owen and Mel, who was pregnant and no doubt reminded her of Dina because of that fact, she breaks. We see and feel just how traumatizing the degradation of her morals has become. Ellie isn't the same person she was when she left Jackson. After Abby attacks and spares them, Ellie returns home with Dina and starts a new life with her new family. Her experiences of what she's gone through and have done have transformed into post-traumatic stress disorder, and instead of taking a chance for healing with her family, the long but peaceful way, she chooses to leave Dina and the baby for the chance to create immediate closure out of murder. This is very reminiscent of Count de Monte Cristo, an obsessive vengeance that pushes the protagonist to risk their second chance at a family. Ellie's descent into vengeance and the compromise of her morals was a bumpy road that didn't seem to end until the last possible moment of redemption. When she had the chance to kill Abby, she suddenly remembered her last conversation with Joel. A tender discussion about forgiveness and moving forward. And then she lets Abby escape. Ellie might have spiraled downward because of her trauma and bloodlust, but the memory of Joel and her wish to move forward won at the last second. But of course, the ending hints that Ellie has a long road ahead of her to truly heal and to find herself again after everything she and her loved ones have gone through. Ellie's tragic descent was mirrored by Abby's ascent out of similar depths. After everything I've said here, it might be surprising to hear that Abby's story was actually my favorite. Although I was deeply repulsed by her at the beginning, I found myself enjoying a kind of sanctuary in her story. She, unlike Ellie, was on an upward journey of leaving behind her original hunt for Joel. After the first hours of struggle, I eventually found myself looking forward to more from her story, and enjoying how strong and generous she became as a protector and friend later in the game. Seeing and acting as Abby in a scene of distress or crisis became comforting since she was so capable in combat and her goals were usually to save someone it was comforting to see and act out kindness once in a while in such a brutal game. But what's funny is that Abby's journey feels like it was really just a few steps ahead of Ellie's. She had been where Ellie was, she had lost her father, her whole home, and spent years fixating on her rage. Her obsession kept her from being able to form long-lasting connections with people like Owen. She had roped the people close to her into a vengeance hunt, jeopardizing them in their safety to kill Joel. But what she found at the end of her all-consuming obsession was that when she got home again, her nightmares didn't stop. She was still reliving her trauma. Killing Joel didn't magically cure her. In fact, it had disturbed her and those who helped her, and her dreams about her father's death continued. It isn't until after being saved by the Seraphites, Yara and Lev, that Abby has the specific dream where, instead of discovering her murdered father, she finds Yara and Lev dead. This is the pivotal moment in Abby's journey, when she decided to go back and help Yara and Lev, two kids of an enemy faction she hardly knew, even though it might cost her her home with the WLF. This time, her fears had evolved from pointing her to revenge to protecting others the way she wished she could have been protected. And this unknowingly begins her healing process. After she goes back for them, her story develops purpose and meaning again. Her mission to protect them grows stronger, it's only after she starts to focus on helping others like this, healing herself through her relationships with them, and strengthening her moral code again, that she begins to be able to let go of her inner fears. This is touched on directly when Abby volunteers to face her phobia of heights and to face hordes of seraphites and wolves to get the supplies they need to save Yara. It's only after she successfully gets what they need to save Yara, even at the confirmed cost of losing her place with the WLF, and sees Yara making her recovery, 
Abby's recurring trauma dream finally develops a good ending. She then completely chooses Yara and Lev over any allegiance to any group, prioritizing her role as a protector and friend over a prized scar hunter or wolf. From here on, Abby's new mission is to help others, and she has now considerably healed some of her past trauma. But she still suffers the consequences of her actions through Ellie's revenge. And this tests Abby's growth. Although Abby has improved, she still isn't a saint, of course. And she was still rehabilitating by Seattle Day 3, after finding Alice, Mel, and Owen killed, after all her other friends had been killed, and almost kills Dina out of revenge. Players were acutely aware of this, and often used this moment to further demonize Abby, claiming she learned nothing since it was Lev who told her to stop. Some of these players might be trying to cling to their thwarted, effective disposition, where they need Abby to stay a villain. But it is a valid point. I argue that Abby's growth was marked by the fact that she could listen to Lev. Our relationships with others open us up to become the best versions of ourselves. If we remember, Lev was willing to let Abby die when they first met. Yara told Lev to help her, and Lev listened because of their connection. Lev told Abby to spare Dina, and then Abby spared her because of her connection with Lev. Before, Abby had purposely kept the people in her life at arm's length, so that she could keep her revenge as her top priority. Finding and killing Joel, she had ignored the concerns of her friends or of Owen for years. But after losing everyone she loved for the second time in her life, she was able, through the healing connections she had made with others, others from whom she could borrow sobriety and compassion, to, if only at the last moment, finally stop herself from killing out of revenge or rage. She stumbled, but this moment was a sign of significant growth for someone with her past. After letting Ellie go, Abby lets go of her tendency for vengeance as well, seeming to forget Ellie and Ellie's actions, and Abby doesn't change her mind or go looking for Ellie for revenge for Owen and the others. Instead, she tries to move on by focusing on starting a new chapter of her life and trying to find a new home with her new and now only friend, Lev. Overall, despite her losses, in Santa Barbara she seemed happier and healthier as a person than ever before. Later, when Ellie finds her and Lev at the slave camp, Abby's only thought is to save Lev and run away. She doesn't want to fight Ellie, even though she would have plenty to avenge. Ellie has to actually threaten to kill Lev in order to get Abby to fight her. Abby, now acting only as a protector, agrees, but it's clear that she doesn't harbor hatred for Ellie. She has already moved on and only cares about the future. When Ellie releases her, Abby doesn't turn on her and escapes with Lev without a second thought. This really communicated that Abby is now fully invested in her future and is no longer driven by her past. In many ways, Abby's journey also reflects Joel's story. Joel underwent the trauma of the initial outbreak, losing his daughter and home. He had a bloody past and committed crimes he wasn't proud of, torturing and killing people. But eventually, he found himself again and a new sense of meaning by focusing on his connection with Ellie, much like Abby and Lev. This might be a hard comparison to bear, but it's also poetic. Something else in particular that they did write about Abby's ascension, for those that cleared the previously mentioned fumbles, was that they set up an argument that even people who have acted selfishly or blindly, the people were repulsed by and hate, can seek redemption and rehabilitate themselves. Abby's story was not only about redeeming ourselves, but finding ourselves again after falling so low, something that many can relate to. What was most enlightening for us was that if we felt sympathetic for Abby at any point, then we had a chance to learn or practice the exceptionally rare skill of courageous compassion. A compassion reserved for those that we would normally want to hate or hurt. This can be very useful in real life if we take what we learned about Abby with us outside of the game. Through Abby, I was inspired to consider the concept that I, in my much smaller and much simpler ways, am not my past, but who I choose to become. The Last of Us Part 2 is an astounding example of eudaimonic media. If you've seen my other videos, you might remember that all media fall on a spectrum of emotional tone. Media can range from being hedonic to eudaimonic. 
Hedonic media involves pleasure, enjoyment, satisfaction, and comfort. This would be comedies and other light-hearted puzzle games without much or any conflict. Eudaimonic media is written not to be comfortable or painless, but to cover deep, complex, and often uncomfortable or painful feelings, as well as touch on higher ideals of morals, ethics, purpose, meaning, self-growth, and the human experience. Eudaimonic media helps us keep in touch with our more complex emotions that we only experience rarely. By watching or playing eudaimonic media, we get practice coping with troubling ideas or events and tinker with our understandings of how to exist in the story of our real lives, which might not be as dramatic, but are still never easy. Because of the chance to learn and grow through safe fictional experiences, interacting with eudaimonic media can increase feelings of long-term well-being. But beyond this, the last and most important achievement of The Last of Us 2 was its ability to capture a very difficult feeling for an audience. That's the temporary expansion of the boundaries of the self. It's a lengthy term, but I want to share a summary from the Rutledge Handbook of Media Use and Well-Being. Through narratives, we experience times past and future, planes near, far, and imaginary or impossible. We can be monsters or saints, woman or man. We can love widely, badly, or well, people we could never otherwise know. Similarly, we can hate, fear, and resent in ways we would hesitate to otherwise experience. In each case, we have expanded the possibilities of our experiences of what it is like to be an individual or social self. We call this temporarily expanded boundaries of the self. Narratives that inspire the expansion are a most convenient means to address a subtle yet fundamental threat to our subjective sense of well-being. The inherent limitations of being a single, limited human being. In short, being ourselves and only ourselves is limiting. It's hard to learn very much by ourselves, but by expanding our sense of self to others, even fictitious others, we strengthen our empathy and sense of connection or compassion to those who are outside of us. This story, like the best eudaimonic media available to us, if taken in with an open mind, provides us with amazing opportunities to step beyond our usual limitations of being one person. We can be Joel, Ellie, Abby, and many others, and stare deeply into the nature of love, loss, trauma, rage, and how to heal ourselves and others. As psychologists have found, engaging in eudaimonic narratives like this, we can learn to loosen our grips on immediate and selfish motivations like anger or revenge, and instead turn our attention to more patient, sympathetic, and pro-social motivations. By the end of the game, on that beach, we might feel a rush of mixed emotions. Anger, sadness, exhaustion, hope, pity, compassion, or frustration. We're no longer just Ellie or Abby. They're themselves acting out their story and we're watching them, and the parts of us that became them as we played them finally find their closure. At this ending, we exist somewhere between and among all these characters. We were brought out of being one person, and have seen the world through their eyes. And through them, we got to glimpse truths that are larger than any one of us. When Ellie and Abby move on in the epilogue, if we've managed to hold on, the ending inspires a rare feeling of poignancy. It's a healing acceptance of sorrow and sadness mixed with tenderness, a solemn affection felt towards ourselves and the hardships of the human experience. It's a deep appreciation of our pain, the pain of others, of what joys remain in the present moment, and possibly in the future. We're left with mixed emotions, both sadness and hope, but an overwhelming encouragement to, like our protagonists, keep moving forward. So, what can we do with everything this game put us through? What's the practical application of all this knowledge and feeling? The Last of Us Part 2 is an incredibly complex tool that we can use to hear from our inner demons and learn more about our emotional and psychological needs that are often buried under our daily mundane tasks. When a story challenges us, makes us uncomfortable, forces us to feel more than what one person can feel at once, 
We can use media literacy skills and knowledge about media psychology quirks, like the kind I've explained here, to understand why we feel the way we do, which is the first step. Now that we know how moral expectancy and effective disposition violations work, next time we interact with a story that violates our expectations, we can take a moment to soothe our discomfort instead of succumbing to our knee-jerk confusion or anger. We can mindfully exercise patience to keep going or choose to disengage calmly from the story if we decide we would rather spend our energy on something else. We can identify when our parasocial relationships run particularly deep for a character or an entertainer and understand that while our feelings for these people are important to us and can enrich our inner lives, they also only exist in ourselves and need to be guarded from time to time to maintain balance. By understanding how identification works, we can analyze our perceptions of protagonists and how these characters act as a mirror of ourselves. By seeing ourselves in them, we give ourselves a chance to scrutinize what otherwise we'd be too close to see in ourselves directly. When we feel moved or elevated by other eudaimonic stories in the future, when our sense of self is expanded, we'll know exactly what we're gaining from that media interaction and how meaningful and rare that experience truly is, even if it is just a video game. The real goal of this game was to bring us into historic awareness of our relationships with anger, violence, and vengeance. With this narrative and these characters, we learned more about ourselves and how we see trauma in others, and what we can do to process our own. We might have learned how much we're willing to overlook for others, or how willing we are to practice compassion for ourselves, our loved ones, or even our enemies. And after meditating on the story from a bird's eye view, after weeks of processing, we might learn that we'd like to grow as Ellie and Abby grew by the end of the game to learn how to move on and forward in our lives instead of being defined by our past or selfish motivations. So even with all the flaws or terrible emotions we felt, if this game helped you learn something new about your inner landscape, about your anger, sadness, or capacity for empathy, then it served its purpose as a tool for self-discovery and self-growth. Thank you so much. If you'd like to see more about movies, video games, and positive media psychology, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe and like the video. And as always, happy playing.